And a very good morning to you all and welcome to Ask X Factor Live. Can you believe we are already up to week 12 of our 18 week pilot and we're excited to have you here today uh, talking about all the different things that can go wrong um, day to day in our organisations and we, Kate and I this morning have very much been um, hoping that for the next 45 minutes, absolutely nothing goes wrong with this session. So um, good morning and welcome. We've got people arriving. I am your host this morning of Ask X Factor Live. My name is Julia Keady. Welcome. Take a seat. Hopefully you've got a nice cup of tea or coffee with you this morning. Um, we are here from uh, pretty much overcast Melbourne this morning. Kate is uh, dialing in from, where are you this morning, Kate? I'm in uh, overcast Gippsland. <laughs> overcast Gippsland and overcast Melbourne. So perhaps let us know if uh, where you're dialing in from. There's a chat box there on the Zoom webinar platform that we're using. Feel free to use that to, throughout the course of this morning with your questions or any comments that you have. There's also a Q&A box there that you can pop any questions into. Use the chat box or the Q&A box, whichever one is easier for you. Um, a very big welcome if this is your first session uh, today with Ask X Factor and with the X Factor Collective. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. And for those who are joining us again and have been with us over the last 11 weeks, welcome back. Um, just to let you know, we are here for the next 45 minutes with the wonderful Kate Buxton. She's an organisational strategist and communications advisor. And she's got some great tools and some great tips to share with you today. And I'm very excited to have Kate here with us. Um, for those of you that don't know me or haven't heard of the X Factor Collective as yet, my name is Julia Keady. I'm the host of this great program that we're piloting. Um, I'm also the founder and CEO of the X Factor Collective. Um, I've, been, I've been a part of the social impact sector for the last 10 years. Before that, I had a career in media and marketing. Um, and over the last 10 years, I've had some really great highlights of being part of the social impact and philanthropy sector. Um, one of those was being the CEO of the Australian Women Donors Network. And many people um, in the collective and close friends of mine know that this idea for the collective is something that I've held in my heart since then. Um, I basically became an accidental consultant um, after Women Donors Network and spent seven years working with a really diverse range of people in the social impact sector individual philanthropists, community foundations, social purpose organisations, charities, social enterprises, government agencies, you name it. And also at that time, over those years, working with a number of consultants. And it was over those years um, that I could really start to see a number of different ways that we could make life easier to be a social change maker, bearing in mind that us as consultants consider ourselves social change makers um, as well. So I decided that we needed to build a collective, um, a community that could have a range of different programs, um, a community where you could find really highly skilled specialist consultants um, and coaches to help you get on with your social mission. Um, so that's what we set out to do. We launched the collective now, I think it was about 14 weeks ago, and we've got our first 30 foundation consultant members we're growing out to 100 members across 300 areas of specialisation and just in an effort to make life easier for you um, to get on with you achieving your social mission. So whatever it is that you need, whether it's something to do with partnerships or human resources or IT or strategy or your boards or fundraising, that you can just pick up the phone um, and come to the collective and find what it is that you need to get on with get on with the task. So great to have you here. Thanks for letting me explain that to you if you haven't heard that before. Um, before I introduce Kate, we are here for the next 45 minutes. We've got seven really great questions that we're going to be going through and Kate's prepared some amazing tools to share with you. Um, as I mentioned before, please feel free to put your questions there in the Q&A or the chat box. We are recording the session today and very excited to show you throughout the course of the morning that our YouTube channel, The Exchange, has just gone live in the last couple of days and all of the episodes and the questions from today's session will be available there for you to go back and watch again at any time into the future. Um, if for some reason your link drops out this morning, um, feel free to call back in on a phone line and I'm just going to show that to you here. You can take a screenshot of that if you like. There's some phone numbers there and a code. If your link drops out, feel free to call back in. 
Fantastic. Great. Well, let's get into it, shall we? I'm super excited to introduce you all to Kate Buxton today, who I met many, many years ago and delighted to have Kate a part of one of our foundation members of the collective. Um, Kate's got this really amazing background. I love it. And you're going to hear more about that today. Um, Kate's worked in current affairs and live television for many years uh, before finding her true passion in the for-purpose sector. Kate served as a board chair, a director and executive officer of a wide range of organisations in the community and philanthropic sectors and has managed a vast number of capital and community based projects and programs. Kate says that in her time, she has seen a ton of things go wrong. <laughs> I have. <laughs> and she says with all full disclosure that she's been responsible for some of them. But learning how to better navigate and leverage the learnings from these so-called failures has led to some fantastic outcomes for Kate. Kate, I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank Good you, morning. Julia. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about things going wrong. Very excited and, and I love to see so many people joining and, and to those that are watching on the new um, X Factor Collective YouTube channel, hello to the future. That's right, exactly. There'll be people watching these episodes in years to come and welcome to you too. What's it like? Are there flying cars yet? Yeah, that's right. Um, what's going wrong in the future? Who, who, who knows, Kate? <laughs> um, Kate, before we get started, can you share with us a little bit about some of the organisations that you have been running over the last couple of years? Yeah, so um, as you said, I started my professional career in the television industry and working my way up, as people do in that industry, from um, being a runner, so running around, getting people cups of coffee and doing everybody's jobs, um, right through to being a general manager uh, of an independent production company called Clark Production and then the studio. And we focused on current affairs and news television and documentary making and, and we're an award-winning uh, company. But it was really when I moved to Australia, as you said, that I found my passion in the for-purpose sector. And, and I have worked for a, a range of, of community-based organisations. So I was a general manager for Lifeline Gippsland, which provides crisis and counselling services in the Gippsland region. Um, when I, I now live in Gippsland, but had, prior to that, I'd been very much a city or a London girl. So when I moved to to Australia, I, I, we ended up in Gippsland, which is a beautiful place to live. Um, and I spent some time actually working with a dairy farming cooperative, which was really amazing to get a better understanding of the challenges facing rural communities and particularly farmers. Um, more recently, um, I was executive officer for Australian Community Philanthropy, which is the peak body for community foundations in Australia. Um, and I've had the privilege to work with a number of community foundations over the years. And I'm, I'm in fact, a, a board member and a former chair of a rural based community foundation. Um, and over and above that, I guess I've worked with uh, a, a number of community mental health and health service providers um, and other very community based grassroots organisations. Great, excellent. It sounds like having, you know, the first part of your career in live television would have very much well set you up to work in yes. the future. <laughs> yes. I think we're going to be laughing a bit today, even though it's a very serious <laughs> topic. <laughs> I think yeah, well, we have to laugh, otherwise we cry sometimes. That's right, that's right. So welcome for those people who are just joining us now to Ask X Factor Live. We're here with Kate Buxton. We're looking at all the different things that could go wrong and not just talking about when things go wrong, but what we can do. What are some of the tools, the intervention tools? And Kate's going to be showing us through some really great um, graphics that she's prepared that you can use, put in your toolbox um, for the months and years to come. So we're looking at when things go wrong with boards, with volunteers, with projects, with donors, um, and sharing some of these great frameworks. So let's get into it, shall we, Kate? Uh, the first question that we have here is, Kate, what do you mean by wrong? What do you mean by things going wrong? Can you unpack this a little for us? Awesome. If you could bring up the first slide, please, Julia. So when we talk about um, things going wrong or things um, getting off track, we're really talking about anything from, well, this isn't turning out quite how I expected to, through right through to, 
oh my God, um, everybody off the boat, we hit an iceberg and we're all going to die. So it's very much a spectrum. And it's important to know where you are on this spectrum, how wrong things have gone, as it will help you to navigate your way through or out of the situation by identifying options and actions that are relevant to the context that you're in. So at the left side of the spectrum, which is the, well, this isn't turning out quite how I expected, um, you are likely to have more options available to you. We can be more proactive when we're on that side of the, uh, of the spectrum because we're better placed to identify and implement actions that are going to prevent us from moving up the spectrum, spectrum towards the more crisis end. But on that right side of the spectrum, the, oh my God, we hit an iceberg side, we tend to be in crisis mode. And we're having to deal with the situation at hand to be reactive and be responsive. Now, of course, sometimes we're gonna end up on the right side of the spectrum, the oh my God end, no matter what we do. But ideally, it's great if we can prevent ourselves getting to that by spotting where we are earlier on and taking actions that prevent us moving our way through. And my experience is that when things do go wrong, and things do go wrong, we know that, people often activate crisis mode. They go into that, that immediate situation. They go into crisis mode, regardless of the situation, which means they may be missing out on options that could resolve or address the situation or could prevent them, as I said, moving up. So I think when we're talking about things going wrong, it's really important to establish how wrong they've actually gone before we do anything else. And part of that process is being aware or alive to the signals and the red flags, and particularly the early, early warning signs. So if you could bring up the next slide, please, Julia. So Obviously, warning signs that things are getting off track, that they're going wrong, are going to be relevant to the particular context that you're in. But there are some general signs that we can be on the lookout, and I've popped them here. So when things, when we, you know, we know we get that kind of tingly feeling in the back of our neck, that sense of mm, a bit of doom is creeping in. Um, and for some of the signs, the early warning signs that we could look out for might be that we're behind schedule in our project or something that we're working on within our organisation. Things are starting to take longer um, than anticipated to get going. We're getting a lack of buy-in from our stakeholders, our staff, our volunteers, and perhaps our clients. We're getting requests for frequent, uh, re frequent requests for progress updates. People are getting nervous around us. That's as an indicator of that. And we might be struggling to get people to come along to meetings to actually engage with us around the, the uh, project or program or the organisational context. Moving a bit further up the spectrum, we might see things like failing to meet our milestones or our targets, over or under budget, and people often focus on being over budget as, as a red flag or an indicator, but under budget can be just as much an indicator because it, it suggests that you're not getting started or we haven't started spending the money that we should be spending. You might see signs of stakeholder or client or customer dissatisfaction or unhappiness. You may struggle to get, having struggled to get people to meet to meetings, you may find that you also get people just not showing up. And you might see higher than usual volunteer attrition or staff attrition or even turnover. And if we're moving up again, and that's getting towards the more crisis end of the spectrum, the oh my God, iceberg end, we can think that's when we're starting to think about things where we've really got no realistic expectation that our objectives are going to be reached. We may have lost our funding or our income streams. Uh, we may see stakeholder or partner withdrawal or key staff and volunteer withdrawal. And we'll also see people playing the blame game, which is where they're, they're, they're blaying off the, the reasons for it around them. So these are the sort of signs that, that it's a good idea that we can keep an eye out for if we're working on something. And ideally what we want to do is intervene before we get to that, that crisis stage. So hopefully that unpacks wrong a bit. That's great. That's a really great explanation, Kate. You should be going into schools and <laughs> <laughs> helping, helping understand that, that whole escalation mode, isn't it? It's kind of part of the whole resilience building space. That's right, yes. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Excellent. Um, moving into question two, this question is, Kate, we, we have a funded project that we are struggling with, uh, which looks like it will fail. What should we do? 
Okay, really great question. Um, if you could bring up the, the next slide, please, Julia. So a first step, I think, when a project is struggling or it looks like it's going off track is to really understand and identify the factors that are causing or contributing to that situation. So it may be that we have internal factors at play, the people or the team that we've assembled around the project isn't coming together or doesn't have the depth of experience or skill that we need. We may have underestimated the resources that we need to apply to that project in order to make it successful. We may have our organisational capacity may be limited or may not be sufficient to deliver the project. There may also be external factors at play. So our partners, our funders, so that their circumstances may have changed. They may not have the same sense of commitment to the project that they once did. Um, and there are also potentially environmental or situational factors. The situation that we are, we may find ourselves in now when we are about to deliver the project may have changed since uh, we envisaged it. So it's important to uh, identify, I think, those factors um, that are contributing to what the situation that you find yourself in now. Mm -hmm. So once we've established a good understanding of why things are going, getting off track or going wrong, we can then really ask ourselves, can we meaningfully change or address these factors? Can we turn those factors around? If the answer is yes, then we can make those necessary course corrections and we can get back on track with our project. If we can't, if the answer to that question is no, we can't change all those, those contributing factors or those influencing factors, um, then we need to ask ourselves, is there another way that we can do this? Can we um, reach our, our intended aims, our intended objectives and our intended goals um, by doing things another way? albeit by another route. And if the answer to that question is, yes, we can, we can change things around a bit, but we can still get where we want to go, we can still hit our destination, then we can make those changes, make those adjustments and get back on track. Um, if the answer to that question is no, that really we can't do things another way, that, that, we are, that we are unable, the contributing factors are beyond our control, we really can't see a way to reach our, our, our intended objectives or our intended goals with our project, we still have the opportunity to rescope or reframe the project to achieve, to achieve a different but a good outcome. Uh, and it might be helpful perhaps if I share um, a case study or an example of this with you. So if you could bring up the, the next slide, please, Julia. So I was involved with uh, a program or a project that was around uh, building resilience in drought affected uh, rural communities. Um, and essentially the program, the aim of the program was to engage local uh, grassroots service providers to provide resilience building programs within communities, within rural, within drought affected communities. Um, and when we started to, to work on this project, we got government funding for it. It was a significant and large project. When we started to move forward the project to try and get it off the ground, we, were, we found we were facing some real barriers. Um, and we were really struggling to get traction to move it forward. So we asked ourselves, you know, what, what, why? What are the reasons for this? And we really found that we had a number of reasons that were contributing to us struggling with this project. So certainly lack of capacity played a part. So whilst the program um, and the project had looked great on paper and in theory when it came to actually delivering it, we were under-resourced. We didn't have the capacity within our organisation to do it. Um, our partners and our uh, collaborators in the, in the program, the local service who would have been responsible for delivering those resilience building services, whilst originally being enthusiastic and committed to the program, when it came to start delivering, were reporting back to us and saying that we really don't feel we can do this, we're under-resourced, we're overstretched. So they weren't able to meet the obligations or the commitment that, commitments that they had made. And part of that, or a lot of that, was explained by the environmental situation and how that had changed. So the communities that, we'd envis that we were hoping to deliver drought resilience programs within had been um, since um, 
approving, receiving funding for the program had actually been impacted by bushfires. So they, the community was, was um, stressed by bushfires. The uh, organisations and the local services were stressed by the current situation. And it was very much our view that the project, in fact, would do harm rather than do good. So when we asked ourselves, can we change the contributing factors? Can we turn this around? The answer to that was no. Yes, we could increase our organisational capacity, but there was really nothing we could do about the environmental situation or the context that we were in. And then when we asked ourselves, is there another way that we can do this? Can we reach or hit or still meet our objectives as we've, as we've identified them in the project proposal? And the answer to that was also no. And whilst we could achieve some of those goals, there was a sense that the project really could not be delivered as we'd originally envisaged it. And so we had the choice. Do we pack up now and say, no, let, this is just not a good idea, not, not, let's not do this? Um, and that would have been one option. But what we actually did is, after consultation with our partners, the funder and the community, the project was re-scoped with very different objectives and very different goals and achieved a very different but a very good outcome. Mm -hmm. So following that pathway through, we were able to navigate through those issues and those challenges and still achieve a really good outcome. You could bring up the next slide, please, Julia. Sure thing. And I think one of the reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, we were still able to achieve a good outcome with this project is because we took a really systematic approach using that framework that involved not just us as the backbone organisation, but all of our stakeholders, including the community, and we enlisted their support in resolving the situation and began by assessing what was going on, understanding what those factors were that were, were causing us to go off track, and we validated our findings with our stakeholders by asking them, asking them directly, what's going on? Why do you think this isn't working? And we kept our stakeholders advised and informed and aware of what was happening throughout this whole process, rather than locking ourselves behind closed doors furtively, you know, working away on why things were going wrong. We involved everybody in finding a solution. And we held off taking corrective action until everybody was on board. And once those actions, actions were in place, once we'd implemented the changes that we needed to make, we started that cycle again. We assessed whether they were working. We validated the, our, our thoughts and our findings with our stakeholders and let them know. And that was the cycle that we employed throughout the duration of that project to keep it on track. So hopefully that, that mm -hmm. helps a little bit. That's fantastic. That last graphic there, Kate, you could almost just have that on the wall in your office, couldn't you? At any, at so many points throughout the day, just to be able to have that as a refresh, you know? What yeah, might be there. absolutely. I mean, I, I think that that cycle is, is applicable to a situation that is, you know, that uncomfortable or where you're struggling or something's going off track, but it's equally applicable to a project that's working well. We always want mm. to be in a, in a learning cycle and to be informing how we're going and what we're doing by looking at all of those aspects and keeping people engaged within the context. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, you're here with us, X Factor Live. Hope you're enjoying the morning so far with, uh, with uh, Kate Buxton here and, and your host, I'm Julia Keady. Welcome if you've just joined us in the last couple of minutes. Um, please feel free to pop any questions that you might have into the Q&A box or chat box and we can jump onto those shortly. Um, let's move across to another question, Kate. Uh, you and I have both been in this situation, which is uh, running an organisation, having a, a board chair that you're working with, uh, working with a board, um, and, you know, invariably things can go wrong <laughs> yes. okay. at this point in time. So let's look at the perspective of CEOs um, and executive officers, and there's hundreds and thousands of people in these roles around the country. What, what should an executive officer or a CEO do if their relationship with their board chair has become difficult? And, and also secondary to that is and if the board start questioning everything that they're doing. So let's unpack this a little bit, mm -hmm. and if you could uh, pop up the next slide, that'd be great, Julia. 
So there are three, I think, main reasons for board or chair CEO issues and conflict. And let's have a little look at each of these. Let's unpack them a little bit. Mm. So oftentimes conflict um, or challenge or issues, you know, where you get that, that tension arises as a result of confusion over roles. And specifically, often, because the line between the role uh, of the board and the role of the EO or the CEO has become blurred and people are in, in, inadvertently stepping all over that line. Now, we all know that boards are supposed to be focused on governance and strategy, leaving the job of running the organisation to the CEO. However, in reality, in real life, a clear demarcation between the role of the board and the role of the CEO is not always clear. Um, in smaller or younger organisations, a, a board may be very hands-on, be very operational of necessity. But unfortunately, this blurriness, this, this murkiness of where the line lies can be a really fertile ground uh, for confusion and even conflict. Board may, members may be uh, expect to be involved in the minutiae um, as CEOs or EOs may resent what they perceive as board interference and then you can have a, a, a challenging situation. Mm -hmm. So if that sounds familiar to you, if that kind of resonates with you, if it's a role-based issue, then a clear step is to really get some clarity around your role or around the roles within the organisation of both the board and the CEO or the EO. But that clarity, when you're going through that process of seeking clarity, should take an account of your real life context. So if you have a board that is operational because it needs to be more operational, that needs to be factored in. It's, it's unhelpful to simply jump to the board should be governance uh, and uh, CEOs or uh, should be concentrating on the operational side. So we need to we need to reflect what our real life situation is and identify where we are now and and potentially where we want to be. Great. Um, so sort of moving on, board and CEO or EO relationships can also suffer during times of crisis um, or challenge or even opportunity when we've got something on the horizon, there's something out there that we would really like to seize, it would be transformative, make a huge difference. All of those things signal change and change can be really difficult to navigate. Stepping outside business of usual for an organisation can be incredibly stressful for everyone. So a question that we need to ask ourselves if we're in that situation where we're facing um, as an EO, a challenge or a crisis or as an organisation and the board is facing it with us is how do we navigate that together? How can we identify solutions that engage everyone in that process? Because solutions that do engage everyone, uh, everyone are the ones that tend to stick. And finally, um, in terms of that kind of basket of things that are often the cause of some of the issues are behavioural. So, I guess just because we work together doesn't mean we have to get along or even like each other very much. But it's super important that we don't let personal issues become professional issues. So if we have clashes of personality, we need to understand that we don't necessarily need to like or, or have you know, kind feelings towards that person, but we do need to work with them and we do need to work with them on a professional basis. And, and to support this, having strong policies around workplace behaviours and appropriate workplace behaviours is really important. Mm. Now, with all of these reasons, whether they relate to a role, the situation or the behavioural issues, the CEO chair relationship is absolutely critical in resolving any challenges. Those two individuals need to come together, they need to work collaboratively as a team to resolve issues, and they need to be a strong team and take a leadership role in that. And 
whilst it's important to navigate the situation at hand because obviously we want to in, uh, resolve issues that are right in front of it it's just as important to ensure that this doesn't happen again or if it does that we're better prepared to deal with it we want to look at both our short-term solutions but also our medium term and long-term solutions mm. and this means ensuring our policies our workplace processes and procedures address all of these issues that our roles are clarified that situation and behavior and the culture of our organization reflects our shared values and that guide our staff and our volunteers including our board who are likely volunteers how they interact and they work with each other sure so if you could bring up perhaps the next slide just um, as a just a brief I guess example um, so as you you mentioned um, the we have here an example of a very of a very small um, for purpose community based organization we have a hands um, on board rather than a hands around board they are involved in the operations because they've got too much work just one paid member of staff or two paid members of staff so what's happened is there's become a confusion around roles and level of responsibility the CEO is pushing back because she feels that the board are too engaged in the organization too involved in the minutiae and the board for their part of feeling some resentment against for that pushback because they've been used to it. They've been used to be, be being involved in that or those operational matters. And once people are once and they have a CEO who's saying, no, you don't need to do that, their question is, well, why am I here then? So in this case, we had the chair and the CEO come together and the very first and most important step was for them to identify that there was a problem and to resolve to solve that. They work with the board to ensure collaboratively, to ensure that everyone understood their roles and res responsibilities, and they expressed those in by updating position descriptions. So they had documentation around that. They did some board training so that people understood the role of a board and ideally what it should be in governance focused. Mm -hmm. They also implemented a plan, and this is really important, to build and preserve and protect that EO-CEO relationship. So they implemented regular monthly chair EO meetings where they allowed time both for formal stuff that needed to be addressed, but all in also informal conversations around how do we feel things are going, are there any issues, a frank and open space where people could really communicate without fear of judgment. Mm. They also implemented an annual evaluation process which had been lacking for both the EO um, and the board so an assessment process for the board so by establishing uh, and communicating properly what the expectations around both the board role um, and an EO's role and with proper KPI sitting underneath it, it it enabled people to kind of feel much more comfortable about what their role was and what they were expected to achieve and they also thinking with an eye on the future improved their orientation processes so ensuring that when people came into the organization either as staff or as board members that they were fully inducted and oriented into all aspects of that organization mm. so I hope that that answers that question yeah that's great Kate fantastic fantastic graphics I can see so many organizations around the country maybe you know around the world now that we have a, a YouTube channel um, <laughs> <there you go. laughs> yeah, that's it. That's hey, are you? Are we going to be YouTube stars? <laughs> well, who knows? You never know. <laughs> um, great. Hopefully, that's helping you here today uh, with some ideas. Um, you know, maybe some of the scenarios that you've been through lately that you're, this is really resonating for you and picking up some tips. Um, we've got some more great tips coming your way over the next few weeks and I'm just going to let Kate have a breather and a glass of water um, while I just share with you what's coming up on the show over the next couple of weeks. Um, we're starting to move into the blockbuster phase of um, Ask X Factor Live where we've got some double sessions um, coming up which is really, really exciting. So. Um, let me just call this up and show you here. Um, fantastic, great. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, we have 
um, next week we have a double session. Sorry, I'm just realizing that I don't actually have my slide there to show you. Isn't that fun? There you go, Kate. Aha, uh -huh, live event. <laughs> yay, yay. So I don't, I don't have a graphic to show you. Oh, no, hang on. Here's something over here that is a real prop. <laughs> Always have a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an 18-week program. Um, this is our PDF version of the program, which um, we'll send to you later on as well. But just over the next two weeks, next week, 7th of November, double session. At 10 o'clock in the morning, we have Liliana Senneli of Perfect Events, um, the top event fundraiser in the country. She's raised tens of millions of dollars through activating events for charities around the country. And we're going to be talking about choosing events what would you choose to do to engage people in your community with what you're doing um, with your organization and then how to use that not just to raise money but how to use that to advance your mission we're going to have some great questions um, that we're going through with liliana next week and to really pick her brain um, followed following that we've got tisha at 11 30. Um, tisha had a tragedy in her life a few weeks ago so we've moved tisha's session up until next week after Liliana and Tisha is another amazing um, woman with great fundraising experience in major gifts and capital campaigns and one of the great things we're going to be unpacking next week with Tisha is that your organization vision is not your fundraising vision and I've seen her in action do this with organizations to to really un be able to articulate what are you seeking to do um, in your fundraising and get that vision really, really clear. So if that sounds like something that you want to learn more about, please come and join in next week on those sessions. The following week on the 14th of November, we have two of our amazing communications agencies and PR agencies coming together, joining forces. They didn't know each other before the collective was formed, but they're coming together and they're gonna be talking about how to raise your profile and some tools and ideas on how to raise your profile as an individual, but also your organization's profile into 2019, using all the different channels that are available to you now and choosing which ones are most relevant for you. So that's gonna be another incredible double session the following week on the 14th of November. Just before we jump back into some questions with Kate, I will show you, I do have this one here, I will show you that we're very excited and you're the first to be seeing this um, this week on the show is that our YouTube channel, The Exchange, uh, is live. Uh, you can go in there. You can subscribe. If you subscribe, you'll just get little notifications when new videos uh, are available. The first seven weeks of Our Sex Factor Live are there now for you. If you miss them or if you want to go back and refresh, there's 58 videos there for you to have a look at. And we're super excited to be exporting this beautiful knowledge that we have in the collective um, around the world and helping people get on with achieving their social mission. So very excited to share that with you. And please feel free to share that with anyone else that you think that this content and the show will be able to assist. Back into some questions now with the wonderful Kate Buxton. Kate, we'd like to move across into talking about donors and funders, which we talked a little bit about before, touched on a little bit before. But this question is something that we've all had a little bit of experience with is, what should you do when a donor is unhappy with your organization and threatens to withdraw their support? So another really good question and, and obviously it can be a really challenging one and, and you know, um, a bit terrifying if you're in an organization and that happens to you. So um, I think it's really important to, to start with unpacking you know where the donor is coming from on this and, and understanding their position and i think a general rule to apply is that donors are not in the business they don't want to give money what they actually want to do is create impact mm -hmm. and if a donor is unhappy with the organization and a common one is oh we're spending too much you're spending too much money on administration and not enough on doing good mm -hmm. that signals that that we are not meeting their goals with respect to the impact that they want to create mm -hmm. so i think an honest conversation is a really important starting point around what that donor's philanthropic goals actually are and are we actually able to meet them mm. now obviously ideally we want to be able to meet them but we may not be able to there is the answer to that question is 
you know, if that, that donor's got a philanthropic goals differ significantly from what our organisation is able to deliver, then there may be a need for a parting of the ways. That may be an, op an option that we need to consider. I'm not suggesting it's the best option or, um, and, and ideally we want to always avo avoid that, but it, is, it should be on the table, I think, as part of that honest conversation. Now, if we feel that there is a kind of misalignment between what the donor's philanthropic goals are and what we're delivering, sometimes that's around the fact that the donor is not, we need to inform and make the donor aware of what we're doing um, and how we're doing it. And, and part of that process is a question that we can ask ourselves is, are we effectively measuring and communicating the impact that we're creating or that we're enabling? And if we, and are we telling, are we communicating that well enough to the donor? And that's often another reason that a donor may be unhappy is they simply may not be aware of what's going on, um, or they may feel it may signal a need for more information or a desire to be more engaged in the process. And I think certainly the pattern that we're seeing and the trend that we're seeing um, in philanthropy and, you know, and in, or in, in, in our for purpose space is that donors are much less passive than they used to be. So kind of gone are the days of checkbook donations or checkbook philanthropists. People actually want to be engaged in the process. They want to see the impact that they're creating. They certainly want to hear about it. And, and we, I guess, as organizations um, need to kind of step up, step up to that and actually meet that donor need and, 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 and com communicate more effectively and find opportunities for donors to be involved in that process. And the other honest question we need to kind of ask ourselves around, particularly when it comes to questions around how much money we're spending on administration or how much isn't directly going to the cause or the initiative that we're supporting is, is that true? That again, an honest question, are we spending too much administration? 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer there is, is absolutely not. But are we then being transparent enough around how we manage our organization and how we allocate our resources? Are we able to communicate more effectively to the donor and do that education piece with them around the importance of administration or around the importance of those overhead costs mm -hmm. they're not wasted money they're important investments that charities will make um, in doing their work and philanthropy makes in doing it work they're an investment in the capacity of an organization um, and so they they are really you know they're valuable and worthwhile and contribute to our impacts and we sometimes need to make that connection between how those are actually contributing contributing to our impact and just to, just to give a tiny example of this in practice, so um, a community foundation, not, is a, actually a New Zealand-based community foundation, were struggling with a donor, a donor who had a fairly large sub-fund with, with, the, with the foundation that said, well, you're spending way too much administration uh, on administration, I'm going to, I'd like to move my sub-fund somewhere else. And what that community foundation is, it worked really closely with that donor. It had a good relationship. It had built that relationship with them, with the donor. And it worked really closely with that donor to explain and help that donor understand the importance that those costs that weren't going directly out the door were to the organisation. And in fact... Um, and explain the need for that and how it contributed to, to impact at the end of the day. And in fact, the outcome of that was that not only did, did the donor retain their sub fund, they actually created another one purely for administration and building capacity within the foundation. So there is a, you know, we can go through this, but I think a lot of it is around um, helping the donor understand our situation and what we're using that money for and the fact that it is creating impact, which at the end of the day is what they want to do. Great. I hope that answers that. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Kate. That's just absolute gold and great example there of, you know, where, where something even more magical comes out, you know, as an outcome, isn't it? You know, strengthening and deepening those relationships. 
it's fabulous when you can when you know from something that that looks like it's going to be really significantly horrible you can get a really actually really great outcome and i don't want to overstate and say this is always the case but obviously there are times that we we navigate ourselves way carefully enough and kind of factor all those elements in that we can come out with an even better outcome than we'd anticipated fantastic it's just great to have like you know, examples like that in the back of our minds that, you know, when you're going into that, you don't have to be so daunted about it, that there could be, you know, something really special come out the other end for everyone involved, you know? Yeah. It? That's and I think the sharing, the sharing of knowledge, and I think part of what we're doing here around, um, you know, Ask X Factor is, is actually supportive of that. Because I think that, you know, as I said, we find examples, we, we, we meet people who've lived through that and can share that knowledge with us. And that's a kind of beautiful place to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to put together the collective as well was that, you know, over time, we, you know, we can be there. Um, with and for you, you might need someone from the collective for an hour or you might need them for a month or a year, a project, but sometimes even 10 minutes, sometimes even be able to call someone that's got experience like you, Kate, you know, that's been in the trenches and know what it's like just to be able to get that reassurance because it can be very isolating for, mm. you know, 90% of organisations in this country are small organisations, just like small business. So you know, how can we build that sense of community and connection in, in what we're doing here? So that's the plan. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, Kate, let's move on to a couple more questions. And we are going to run over time if that's okay with you, Kate. Um, but I would love to get through these next couple of questions. We do say that we run up to 10.45. Sometimes we run up to 11. Um, I'd love to keep going with you, Kate, if that's okay. If you need to drop out, we completely understand. Um, if you do need to go, I'm just going to show you before you leave that you can read about Kate on our website, um, thexfactorcollective.com. All of our members there at the moment, and we have more members joining over the next month or two as well, have their own profile page where you can read about their background, their areas of specialisation. Um, some of them have testimonials on there from other people that they've worked with. And then you can connect through to them if you'd like to speak with them about your project or your needs. Uh, we have a concierge service as well at the X Factor Collective, a little bit like a, a luxury hotel where you can um, come and get a phone charger. Um, no, you can actually just give us a call and say, this is what I need. This is where I'm up to. What do you think um, I should do next? And we're growing that concierge with really experienced people in the concierge that can give you that guidance and advice, connect you up with a member in our community if we have that area of specialisation or give you some advice on what you might do next um, in the community. So a really valuable service that we could see was missing um, in the sector and that we're delivering um, here for you at the collective. So if you need to drop off um, now, um, have a beautiful rest of your day, but please feel free to stay for these next couple of really great questions. Um, um, Kate, back to you. Um, the next question here is a really great one around media and publicity. And we've all had an experience with this mm -hmm. and love your advice. How do you deal with negative or completely inaccurate publicity or media that threatens your credibility or reputation? Um, yeah, so look, it, it, we have all been there and it's, look, it's a really horrible place to be, but I think we can navigate our way through it. So I think a first step is to be prepared. Um, if we can have a plan within our organisations, within our situations for responding to negative publicity and actually develop a series of responses to to the scenarios that are related to you. We all know, or you should know within your organization, or you will know within your organization what they're likely to be. So we were just talking around um, administration and charities. There's a lot of media attention around that right now. So wherever a charity that receives a donation or, a, or a, a foundation that receives donations, it makes sense for us to think about how we might respond if that light gets shined on us. So having a plan I think is really important. When something has come out, we've got something that, that, that's, that's casting doubt on us as an organisation or is, is potentially having you know, reputational issues, it, and there is likely to be a light shine and interest on us. It's vital to keep 
everybody on message, you know, to make sure that the, your response is cohesive, that, that everyone is saying the same thing in response. Now, the easiest way to do that is to nominate one person within your organization to be the spokesperson and then to stick to it because that reduces the risk of fragmented messages or people saying the wrong thing or those, oh my God moments, why did they say that? And I guess the other is kind of preventative in terms of this is something we should be doing regardless, is that we should be building relationships, particularly with the media. Um, that will, if we, if we develop relationships with journalists, with others um, in that space, they will have a much better understanding of our organisation. And it is absolutely my experience that it means that they are much more likely to give you a call and say, hey, there's this story come across my desk, or hey, is this true? And actually engage with you in a conversation and give you an opportunity to kind of head it off at the pass before they run a, a piece. Mm. So I think the other aspect is obviously when we're having something, when something's out there, we want to tell our story. Um, when we're dealing with the media, and, and particularly this is relevant to, to um, visual media, so someone who's a reporter, you know, parking outside your house with a, a camera or a, a, a video camera, is always start with a positive statement. So when you're responding to a question, start with an affirmation of your organization you know we have proudly delivered or we have done this before you address the, the the negative piece and there's a kind of a really practical reason for that which is that it's actually quite hard to edit sentences or to edit a sentence mid-sentence so if you start with a positive affirmation or a positive and then head and then move immediately in kind of the same sentence into addressing the negative side of it they're likely to have to to include the positive bit obviously that's not quite so relevant to um, something that's written, so written journalism or online uh, journalism. But nevertheless, if you start with that affirmation, it's about you shaping the narrative, you taking control of the narrative. Clearly, we want to address inaccuracies or fake news. We must do that. But we need to do that systematically without being defensive. And it's, that's a really hard thing to do because the minute you try and rebut something or you rebuff something or you say that's not the case, you can potentially come off as being defensive. So it's really thinking about how you present that, um, that, that rebuttal, how you uh, contradict that without looking like that you're being defensive. So it's about doing it calmly and systematically and truthfully. Another a really important point is if there is a problem, if it's not fake news, if that there's actually a genuine issue that's being reported on, own it. It's much better to, to fess up, come clean and say, yes, this is a problem, but this is how we are dealing with it, rather than overspin it, try and avoid it, or look like you might be, you know, look like you're terribly guilty. So I think if there are problems that have been brought into the light, then we need to own those and, 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 and communicate how we are dealing with those and what steps we're taking to address them. And another point, I think a sort of final point in this tell your story is don't feed the trolls. So when there's any kind of drama or when there's media or there's a light being shone on a particular aspect, people will want to make mischief. They'll come out and particularly with an opening up of uh, participatory channels like Twitter um, and YouTube and others, people love to leave negative comments. They love to be there and, and kind of, you know, that they get... They, they, they get a kick out of it, essentially. So be circumspect in who you respond to. If you're reading your Twitter feed and you're seeing all these negative comments, don't feel that you have to respond to every, every one of them. Some you can safely leave, and particularly the troll-like ones that are really just seeking to, to enlarge or amplify the crisis. And I guess my final point that is any, in any kind of cycle um, where you, you are facing, you know, negative media attention or negative attention is to ensure that you give people a heads up that it's coming and to complete keep them informed as you're traveling it so making sure that you communicate with your stakeholders to let them know that there might be something negative coming out to let them know how you're addressing it to reassure them that it doesn't represent your organization and keep them involved and engaged in the um, in the cycle as it progresses 
So hopefully that, that gives you some idea of, or some tips and tricks to, to navigate those sorts of situations. That's fantastic, Kate. Some really great tips in there and some really great reminders as well. I think sometimes people think that, um, you know, they've got that covered. Yeah, mm. we know what to do when, you know, we, we know all the journos and we know all of this, but just those little things like knowing who's going to be the spokesperson getting everyone on that same song sheet. Such great reminders. Love that. Yeah, and getting, look, reacting as quickly as you can. I mean, there were a recent example of where an organisation was called into question and there was some really negative mainstream publicity around it. That organisation was well prepared. You know, they, you know, they were in a space where they knew these sorts of stories floated around. The story was actually inaccurate and they were able to be super reactive and get something onto their website immediately. And it was a brilliantly written piece that absolutely kind of you know really really changed the narrative around that it was a really good example uh, of how to respond well in this sort of situation yeah that's great thank you so much for that Kate um another area that uh well we are live and we, we <laughs> lots of things can go wrong um <laughs> in the world of being live um but um Kate, you've been involved in running a lot of events and I think that's actually how we might have first met was through the yes. Community Foundations Forum um, that you have most wonderfully organised and run over the last few years. This next question relates to a lot of those experiences that you've had, which is what do you do if something goes wrong in a live event? <laughs> yes, I'm sure the reason that I've got lots of grey hair is because of <laughs> live events. Um, so look, um, the nature of live events is that something probably will go wrong. I mean, that, that's essentially their nature. And to a certain extent, I think we should actually embrace that because that's what makes them special and memorable. So I think that there's an element of that, that you know, I myself, you know, you live in fear of, of something going wrong, the speaker not turning up. But I think if we can, if we can embrace the fact that a live event is likely to have that. It delivers something really special. People are there because they want to participate and be involved. And there's nothing that illustrates that more than if something goes wrong. So I think that, you know, to an extent we need to kind of try and, and get some perspective on this and try and embrace the nature of the live event. But I think that aside, I think navigating something going wrong with a live event comes down to some really simple things. And, and I think probably the most obvious is planning. So we need to plan when we're, when we're delivering live events for as many eventualities as we can think of. So backup speakers, backup panellists, I like to think of them as understudies. And I have oftentimes when I've had a particularly a keynote speaker that might be travelling from overseas and there could be an issue with them getting there, I've actually enlisted an understudy and been really clear that, look, this is a horrible thing to ask you, but would you be prepared to step in in the event that we don't have that person set up? So if you look at my spreadsheets for live events, you'll see what's supposed to happen and then you'll see two more columns that say backup plan. Oh, what do we do if something goes wrong? I think for um, situations also, it's, it's important to always or, or try and think outside the box. So, or, um, so rather than just replace a speaker or rather than just try and fill a hole, think about ways that you can turn that into an opportunity. So, you know, in the event that a speaker's late and they're delayed, rather than having sitting everybody there twiddling their thumbs, kind of looking at their phones, throw a group, you know, have a room-based activity, a get to know you, solve a problem, harness the collective experience and expertise of everyone in that room, get them involved because that will make it memorable and it will keep people engaged and they'll remember that bit of it rather than thing going wrong and i guess my final kind of tip over and above planning and thinking about what you do to fill holes or problems is that a good facilitator can a hundred percent save your life um, so having so i think that they're really we we often spend a lot of time when we and i know we think about facilitators but we often spend a lot of time thinking about the panelists and the keynotes and those other bits and perhaps a little bit less on the people that are going to hold all that and bring it all together as the facilitator or the host or the mc a really good facilitator Facilitator will 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 help you enormously. I remember I was working um, when I was at uh, an organisation.
organization in the UK, we delivered a very major award ceremony every year. Um, and uh, one year in the film industry and one year we had four award recipients not turn up. It was, <laughs> I think we only had six awards and it was <laughs> awful. We were tearing our hair out, but we had a fabulous um, MC who made the whole thing into this huge joke. So in fact, in some respects, them not turning up was better than if they had turned up because it was funnier and more engaging and the audience loved it. So um, really think about who you've got on that stage, who's in the spotlight there and holds those threads together because they can really, they can really and truly save your life. Fantastic. Excellent. Some really, some really great tips there, Kate. And, 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 and also, I think on reflection is that we don't often hear about people talking about the understudy side of things and how you would, how you would navigate that and have that conversation with someone who is fantastic at um, what they do and what they can deliver. Um, but being able to be, you know, open and honest, honest enough to be able to take that approach. Um, it's, it's really brave, um, a brave approach, practic very practical, um, but also having more dialogue about that in the sector as well, that we can just make that something that's, you know, really comfortable for people to do. Yeah, and look, obviously, um, it's, oh, if you're looking at that understudy approach or having that backup person, it's easier usually to do with a panellist because they can just come on. Yeah. Um, but with a, it's more difficult and challenging when you have someone who's delivering a, you know, a significant bit of content as part of your event. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes you've got people within your own family or organisational family that you are comfortable to have that conversation with. Mm -hmm. So if you have a board member or you have someone that you have a professional relationship and you, you know, you're going to be honest. You know, it, look, I hate to ask you this but it you know would you be prepared to have that in place and if you can find a way to use the content that they might develop and have in another way if they have not called on to understudy so much the better absolutely yeah great great advice love that thank you Kate um, we've got one final question here on volunteers and then we're going to wrap things up we are at 11 o'clock but we're having so much fun so we're going to keep going this next question is something that so many people have on the, you know, on the, on their lips at the moment, and it's around volunteers. You know, we constantly have questions to do with volunteers, and things can go wrong with our volunteers. So the question is, Kate, how do you get volunteers back on board after something has gone wrong? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and look, this is a, I mean, it's a, you know, many of our organisations, most of us in, in our sector are dependent on our wonderful volunteers who work tirelessly and hard. Um, and it's really important that, you know, we treat them with respect and that, you know, we recognise and acknowledge the enormous contribution that they make um, to so many people. Um, I think if you're struggling to get volunteers back on board after something has happened or that something has gone wrong it's really important to to own the issue or to acknowledge the issue the thing to identify what has gone wrong and then own and acknowledge it and be really open and honest around that um, and then a next stage is to involve the volunteers actually in the solution so rather than saying well yes this went wrong but you know we fixed it it's much better if you say well yes this has gone wrong how do we fix it and get their input because as I think it's um, solutions that that engage everyone work better and, and stick longer um, and, and I guess an example of this would be from my own, you know, experience where we had um, some, some volunteers who were working in a very, um, they were responding to bushfires, so they were, and it was an unusual, it was not business as usual, it was an unusual situation, and the volunteers, you know, they, they rose to the challenge, they were out there in the community supporting the community, you know, in a time of real crisis, but it created some real challenges for them, and they were really unhappy at the end of that, they felt that, you know, it had just been too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had to say, you know, we had to, the first stage was for us to go, yeah, you're right, it was. Um, you know, it was, it was very unusual circumstances and we asked you to do something that we wouldn't normally, and you did it, thank you. But perhaps on reflection, we should have done it another way. And then we engaged with those volunteers and have a very comprehensive process around what had happened, 
what their thoughts and feelings were. We gave them an opportunity to really share that important information and really, you know, have, have a go at us basically, which they needed to do. But we then moved to a positive space, which is how do we not, how do we, if this happens again, what do we do? How do we do this better or should we not do it at all? And so it was a very a comprehensive and cohesive process where we produced a report that was shared widely. It was a transparent process that engaged of the volunteers and the organization within it um, and I'm you know I'm proud that we did it that way um, because I think that it that at the end of the day what it the, the outcome was a good outcome um, and I think I guess as a final point is it's important to acknowledge that whilst our volunteers aren't paid our relationship is still based on a contract um, which, by the way, should be a written contract. You should have a written contract with your volunteers in the same way that you have a contract with your staff members. Um, and that, that there are expectations on both parties, both the volunteer and the, the person who's engaging the volunteer. And those should be honoured. And I think it's really important that the that particularly in smaller organisations where there's a sense that we can't expect them to do that because they're a volunteer or they can not show up and that's okay because they're not paid. That actually isn't the case. The volunteer is wonderful and, and they're giving of their time, but they are also getting something in return, which obviously should be part of that arrangement. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that, that we acknowledge that, that this is a relationship that has obligations on both sides uh, and we need to sort those through. That's a great, great reminder, Kate. And I love that part about involving them in the solution. I think, you know, we sometimes forget that, don't we? We sort of come mm. up with the solution. We, we go to that debriefing session or that meeting and we've already got the solution to offer. But um, how much more you can um, evolve that relationship by actually um, involving them in the solution, we often forget that in a lot of different parts of our work. That's a really great reminder. I'm taking that one for the rest of my week. <laughs> <laughs> um, now before we wrap up and we have gone really over time today but how why not these are really great questions um, that are going to help so many people here today and also into the future uh, we will have all of these questions cut up into little bite-sized episodes live on our YouTube channel The Exchange um, in the next couple of weeks for you but Kate just while we wrap up um, I'd love to hear your thoughts around you know caring looking after ourselves um, the, the importance of self-care when things go wrong. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, absolutely vital. I mean, I think that, you know, when things go wrong, it's stressful, um, we're working hard. I think that it's, it's absolutely vital during that process that we do, as you said, look after ourselves. That we, and that means we need to get some perspective or we need to keep perspective and we need to put in place some measures that protect us as individuals against the kind of vagaries of what's going on around us. Mm -hmm. um, and that means taking some, you know, some, some steps that we would normally take um, and not, or if we're already taking them, not keep observing them. So eat healthy, you know, do the exercise that we need to do. She says never doing exercise, but <laughs> we'll leave that one to another day. Um, you know, look after yourself you know, get plenty of sleep. I think connecting with your peers, you know, sh having someone to talk about the situation, and obviously sometimes that can be challenging if we're talking confidence, confidentiality and privacy, but actually having someone that you can talk honestly and openly, openly about the situation that you're facing with is really important. It, within the counselling profession, you know, there is such a thing as supervisors, so counsellors can go debrief with a supervisor, it's a confidential arrangement, um, and it's a really important good process, and I think we should probably adopt more of that within our environment. I mean, I've seen um, people emerge, you know, EOs, CEOs, board members, um, staff, um, emerge from difficult situations where things have gone wrong, where their confidence really um, suffered. You know, it's taken them a long time to really get back on their feet. So it's really important that we do look after ourselves um, through that process. And as I said, getting some perspective on it is really important. Mm. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's important to us here at the collective as well as we're building out the collective. Um, yes, we have people that can help you with all of those hard skills, but we're also building out the whole soft side, the whole holistic side of what it is to, to be in, you know, running an organisation, to be, um, you know, pushing forward a social mission in life. So 
you know, last week we talked about money mindset and some of our money stories and the way they can hold us back in achieving what we're, you know, looking to achieve. Um, we also have, just to let you know, we also have um, on our website um, our community blog, which is called The Campfire. Um, and all of our members write for our community blog. And there's some really great pieces in there around um, understanding different personalities in your organisation. There's some great pieces written there by a psychologist, Adam Blanche, on, on community wellbeing and mm. self-care um, and your own wellbeing. So, you know, feel free to connect with us in a number of different ways, whether it's, you know, reading an article that um, is going to give you some, some new tools and some skills and some reassurance, um, or come here on our show, um, the Exchange YouTube channel. Uh, we're building out lots of great aspects of our community and we're delighted to share them with you. So, um, Kate, thank you so, so very much for preparing for today's Ask X Factor Live. You have just shared so much of your beautiful knowledge um, and experiences with us and we're deeply appreciative. Oh, thank you, Julia. It's been an absolute pleasure. Great. Fantastic. Well, that is a wrap. Um, we will send you um, an email over the next 24 hours with some links to Kate's page. We'll keep you posted when these episodes will be up on the exchange. Please feel free to tell people about our program. We have, we've got another six weeks, I think, left of our 18-week pilot. Um, and we will send you this PDF, which gives you the full program. Feel free to share it with people in your organisation, in your teams, um, people that you know in the sector that you think might benefit from being a part of our community. So thank you all. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. All the best and have a beautiful day. Bye. Bye, Kate. Bye.